In our last session together, we reminded ourselves that the founders of our country clearly intended for the Christian religion, Christian principles, Christian morality to serve as the platform on which the republic is poised. We then raised the question that is raised many times in our country these days, but, but weren't, the, weren't the founders a bunch of deists and, and racist slave owners? We dealt with the matter of the founders and slavery in our last session. Now we turn our attention to this other matter of deism. Were the founders of our country, in fact, deists? Often have we heard even high-ranking political theorists and professors in prestigious universities claim, oh, the founders were not Christian anyways, in any form or fashion. They were deists. Uh, they believed in a generic presence. Well, let's, let's try to answer that question. Were the founders deists? And to do that, first, don't you have to get a definition? What are we talking about, deism? So if you go to a standard dictionary these days, uh, like, for instance, the American Heritage Dictionary. Here is the definition of deism, the belief based solely on reason in a God who created the universe and then abandoned it, assuming no control over life, exerting no influence on natural phenomena, and giving no supernatural revelation. Here is the uh, current Webster's New World Collegiate Dictionary. Belief in the existence of a God on purely rational grounds without reliance on revelation or authority, especially the 17th and 18th century doctrine that God created the world in its natural laws, but takes no further part in its functioning. Just to show you that I'm not misrepresenting the current understanding of this term, let's move to another, uh, the Random House uh, Webster's Dictionary. A belief in the existence of a God on the evidence of reason and nature only, with rejection of supernatural revelation, distinguished from theism, and a secondary definition, belief in a God who created the world, but has since remained indifferent to it. Here's yet another current English dictionary. Rational belief in God, a belief in God based on reason rather than revelation, and involving the view that God has set the universe in motion, but does not interfere with how it runs. Yet another, Cambridge. The belief in a single God who does not act to influence events and whose existence has no connection with religions, religious buildings, or religious books, etc. You know, I'm amazed in looking at a current definition of deism because if that is what we mean, when we say the founders were deists, then I stand before you and confidently affirm none of the founders were deists. Now that's a big claim. How can I prove that? Especially going up against all these highfalutin authorities that insist that the founders were deists. Well, rather than giving you my opinion or simply asserting, making assertions without evidence, let's go back and see what the founders themselves said. And then you can answer the question whether you want to believe the founders themselves or whether you want to believe political theorists and uh, educators in the last 50 years and what they claim the founders believe. Take, for example, John Quincy Adams, who was the son of the quintessential founder, John Adams, who served as first vice president, second president, involved in many other ways. You know, his oldest son, John Quincy, he literally took under his arm and walked him through the founding of our country. Now, John Quincy himself had a distinguished career during the founding era, not only as our sixth president, but he served in both the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, served as an ambassador to a number of different countries in behalf of the United States. He was there at the founding. And yet in a speech, a July 4th speech that he was invited to deliver some years after the founding, in fact, 1821, uh, this was to be delivered to the city of Washington. In that, he did a tremendous job of summarizing for us the religious and philosophical complexion of the founders. Here's what he said. From the day of the Declaration 
the people of the North American Union and of its constituent states were associated bodies of civilized men and Christians in a state of nature but not of anarchy. They were bound by the laws of God which they all and by the laws of the gospel which they nearly all acknowledged as the rules of their conduct. So, here is one of the founders, one at the very beginning of our nation, who says, you know, when you look back at the Declaration in the beginning of our country, it is clear that when you look at all of our founders, every one of them believed in God. He was talking about the God of the Bible. And, notice this, nearly all of the founders, that's the vast majority of them, believed in the gospel, that is, Christianity. So notice, there, were, there was not an atheist among the founders. They all believed in God. They all believed in the God of the Bible. And they all, most all of them believed in Christianity. So that really settles the question. If you find an occasional deist among them, then you are going against the mainstream of who the deists were. But you know what? We need to ask another question. Is, was their definition of deism the same as our definition of deism? Does the word deism as defined in 1776, is that the same definition that we find in modern English dictionaries? As a matter of fact, no, it is not. And to prove it to you, I'm going to put a little tedium on you and urge you to read with me a number of dictionaries from the founding era, both from England and America, that show us the condition of the English language and the definition of deism at that time. Here is one from 1775, Treasury of the English Language. Deism is defined as the doctrine or opinion of those who own the belief of a God but deny his having ever given or the probability of his ever giving a revelation. Deist is a person who believes the existence of God but denies all revelation in general. Here is another English dictionary, this one from 1776. A sect among the Christians of most or all denominations who believe there is one God, a providence, the immortality of the soul, virtue and vice, rewards and punishments, but reject revelation and believe no more than what natural light discovers to them and believe no other article of the Christian religion or any other. Here is one from 1780. Again, a dictionary of the English language by Thomas Sheridan. Deism is the opinion of those that only acknowledge one God without the reception of any revealed religion. A deist is a man who follows no particular religion but only acknowledges the existence of God. Here is 1788. English Dictionary. Deism, a denying of the Scriptures. Notice how that harmonizes with what we've already seen. They deny revelation. A deist is one who adheres uh, to deism. Here is a Dictionary of the English Language. This one by John Ash from 1795. He defines deism as the doctrine or opinions of those who acknowledge the being of a God but reject revelation. A deist is one who acknowledges the being of a God but rejects divine revelation, one who denies the divine authority of the scriptures. Moving to 1798, Stephen Jones, Dictionary of the English Language. Deism is the opinion of those who, disbelieving all revealed religion, acknowledge only the natural, namely the existence of one God, His providence, virtue and vice, the immortality of the soul, and rewards and punishments after death. Consequently, a deist is a man who follows no particular religion, but only acknowledges the existence of God. Moving to Johnson's Dictionary, moving into the 19th century, 1820, the English language was still defining deism the same way, the opinion of those who acknowledge one God, but deny revealed religion. Therefore, a deist is one who believes in the existence of God, but follows no particular religion. 1822, John Walker's Critical Pronouncing Dictionary. Deism is the belief in one God without the reception of revealed religion, a denial of revelation. Therefore, a deist is a man who follows no particular religion, but only acknowledges God. 1826, 
another dictionary, this one by uh, two other gentlemen. Deism, the acknowledging of one God but rejecting the scriptures. A deist, one who follows no particular religion but only acknowledges the existence of God without any other article of faith. 1854, now notice, well out of the founding era, the English language is still defining deism the same way. The doctrine or creed of a deist, belief in the existence of God coupled with a disbelief of revealed religion. One who believes in the existence of God, but disbelieves revealed religion. Well, those are standard English dictionaries, not only from the founding period leading up to it, but then continuing for many years thereafter. But let's go to Noah Webster. Noah Webster was a founder, and he produced a dictionary. So his is clearly a very definitive understanding of the concept of deism and deists from the perspective of the founders themselves. Notice in his dictionary, this is in fact an 1828 edition, well out of the founding era, but nevertheless authored by him. Deism, the doctrine or creed of a deist, the belief or system of religious opinions of those, now notice, who acknowledge the existence of one God, but deny re revelation. Or deism is the belief in natural religion only, or those truths in doctrine and practice, which man is to discover by the light of reason, independent and exclusive of any revelation from God. Hence, deism implies, now notice this, infidelity or a disbelief in the divine origin of the scriptures. This founder says, if you're a deist, you're an infidel. He then quotes Patrick Henry, another founder. The view which the rising greatness of our country presents to my eyes is greatly tarnished by the general prevalence of deism, which with me is but another name for vice and depravity. Then Webster defines the term deist one who believes in the existence of a God but denies revealed religion, but follows the light of nature and reason as his only guides in doctrine and practice a free thinker. Now, moving all the way into the 20th century, the Webster's uh, Dictionary by this time is still defining the term essentially the same. Deism is the doctrine or creed of a deist, the belief or system of those who acknowledge the existence of one God but deny revelation. Deism is the belief in natural religion only, or those truths in doctrine and practice which man is to discover by the light of reason independent of any revelation from God. Hence, deism implies infidelity, or a disbelief in the divine origin of the scriptures. Let's back up just a moment to an earlier edition of Webster, 1817. He makes it very succinct in this uh, compiled uh, listing of terms. Deism is a denial of revelation. Therefore, a deist is an infidel or a disbeliever. An 1833 edition of Webster's Dictionary, same thing. A denial of revelation, one who denies a revelation from God. Now, did you notice as we were going through all of those definitions, you never once found in the definitions from the founding era that deism involves a deity that has set himself apart from creation, that has abandoned creation, that has no further interaction with creation. That does not occur one time in their definition of deism. So we are forced to conclude. The founders define deism as belief in the one God, the one God of the Bible, the Creator, but rejecting direct revelation from Him in the form of of Bible inspiration. Now that was the definition that prevailed for this concept at the very beginning of our country. So unlike today's deists, the founders all believed, every one of them, believed that the God of the Bible, the one supreme being, was active in the world and, and active in the founding of our republic. Now that's a very different understanding. Now were any of the founders Deists according to their definition? I believe there were. Well, how many? Scores or most of them, as we have been told? Absolutely not. In fact, what I have discovered is out of hundreds of individuals that can be styled a founder, I've only found four where you can really get in there and find out where they felt, how they felt and where they stood on this subject. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, by the way, the least religious of the founders. Out of the masses of the founders, 
the least religious. Thomas Paine, Ethan Allen. Let me take you through these four very quickly. There is no question that these four believed in the God of the Bible. I'm going to prove that to you. They openly acknowledged God's presence and God's providential actions, especially in the founding of our civilization. For example, when Thomas Jefferson was elected to the presidency, our third president, the year was 1801, in his inaugural speech, he indicated that we as a people and he himself acknowledge and adore an overruling providence which by all its dispensations proves that it delights in the happiness of man here and his greater happiness hereafter. With all these blessings, what more is necessary to make us a happy and a prosperous people? And then he brought his, uh, his great speech to a close. May that infinite power which rules the destinies of the universe lead our counsels to what is best and give them a favorable issue for your peace and your prosperity. From that one speech alone, it is clear Thomas Jefferson believed that God was involved in the universe and specifically active in assisting presidents and assisting the American governing bodies uh, to function in such a way that peace and prosperity would ensue. And what about his second inaugural? March of 1805, I shall need to the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life. Folks, that proves that Thomas Jefferson believed not only in the God of the Bible, the same God that led Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, Thomas Jefferson believed that's the same God that led our forefathers out of England into this land and has provided us with this wonderful environment. Don't tell me that Thomas Jefferson was a deist according to, day, to today's definition. He was not. Nor was he a believer in some generic presence, some providence, rather than the personality of the God of the Bible. This one speech made to the whole nation for posterity as president proves that he believed in the God of the Bible. Notice further, in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Dr. Benjamin Rush in April of 1803, in this letter, Thomas Jefferson indicated his view with regard to Christianity. In fact, he said uh, that people were accusing him of uh, opposing the Christian religion or being very anti-Christian. He says, uh, my views are the result of a life of inquiry and reflection and very different from that anti-Christian system imputed to me by those who know nothing of my opinions. He said, to the corruptions of Christianity, I am indeed opposed. And I am too, aren't you? There are many corruptions of Christianity. But he says, not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others. Now he goes ahead to explain in that letter that uh, he gives an indication somewhat that he's not certain that Jesus Christ uh, claimed to be God in the flesh. But the point is, much of Thomas Jeff many of Thomas Jefferson's quotes that are given to argue that he didn't believe in Christianity or Christian principles are actually quotations in context that are his railing against the corruptions of Christianity, the perversions of Christianity. He himself said, I believe in the precepts of Jesus Christ. And he acknowledged them to in fact be the principles on which the uh, republic was founded. So out of the hundreds of founders, Thomas Jefferson, uh, not really the deist that we've been told that he was. Well, what about Benjamin Franklin? You know, the, the term deism was actually used by himself to refer to himself, but oh, he defined it differently than we do. Because in the Constitutional Convention, June 28, 1787 in Philadelphia, when our founders, after the close of the Revolutionary War, were gathered to try to hammer out the Constitution that would govern us as a nation, in that uh, session, he proposed prayer and repeatedly quoted Scripture in that proposal 
as justification for appealing to the one true God who not only aided them throughout the founding of the nation, but would continue to aid them as they hammered out the constitutions of government. That was proof that he was not a deist by today's definition. And then consider these quotes that came from Dr. Franklin. He said, for example, in response to one who had written him, you desire to know something of my religion. Here's my creed. I believe in one God, creator of the universe, that he governs it by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped, that the most acceptable service we can render to him is doing good to his other children, that the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life respecting its conduct in this. These I take to be the fundamental principles of all sound religion and I regard them as you do in whatever sect I meet with them. Well, I, I don't necessarily agree with Dr. Franklin about how these principles uh, are to omit other principles like those about Christ, but you can see that these principles, these fundamental values that he believed in do not square with the deistical attachment, the deistical reputation that has been pinned upon him. What about this quote? He said, as to Jesus of Nazareth, my opinion of whom you particularly desire, I think the system of morals in his religion as he left them to us, the best the world ever saw or is likely to see. History will also afford frequent opportunities of showing the necessity of a public religion and the excellency of the Christian religion above all others, ancient or modern. Let me summarize Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Here with your own eyes, you are seeing the holographic notes, handwritten image, actual image of the handwritten notes that both Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson produced in their efforts to develop, to design a great seal for the United States. In essence, they both uh, proposed the same design. And if you were to put that into the form of the seal, here's what it would have looked like. Here is uh, Moses and the Israelites having crossed the Red Sea, Pharaoh in his chariot with his crown and sword uplifted, and his military, Egyptian military, being drowned in the Red Sea, God's presence in the form of a, a pillar of fire and a cloud above them, and notice the national motto that both Jefferson and Franklin wanted instated for our nation, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. I'm telling you, these two men were not the deists that we have been told they were. Uh, they certainly believed in the God of the Bible and his interaction in our lives. Well, wait a minute. What about Thomas Paine? Now, come on, Thomas Paine. He's been cited as the ultimate deist of the founders. Well, I have to pretty much agree with that. So out of scores, hundreds, yeah, Thomas Paine could probably be pinpointed as a person who uh, was in fact a deist in the sense that was defined in uh, the founding era. But that's not the whole story. Let me give you a little further information. Do you realize that Thomas Paine was actually born in England and did not even immigrate to the United States until two years before the Declaration of Independence? He was not, I would say, an American in the full-fledged sense. He really hadn't grown up here. He wrote Common Sense two years after getting here, which was a tremendous uh, little publication that uh, fired the nation's imagination. In fact, John Adams said, without the pen of the author of Common Sense, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. But you know, after that era, he, he lived in France uh, for most of the 1790s when the French Revolution was being implemented. He wrote a, a booklet called The Rights of Man in which he defended the French Revolution with all of its horrors and guillotine and all of its atrocities. In fact, the French liked him. He was elected to the French National Convention. However, Robespierre did not like him, regarded him as an enemy. And so in 1793, he was arrested and imprisoned in France and then released in 1794. And isn't it interesting that he wrote The Age of Reason and published it in 1794, no doubt writing it partially while he was in prison. And in this volume, it is true, he advocates deism, argues against institutionalized religion in general and Christian doctrine in particular. But there are two important considerations that we must take into account. Number one, Thomas Paine was not an atheist. No atheist today can quote Thomas Paine as agreeing with him. He believed in the one God and the final judgment at the end of time. 
And number two, he absolutely did not represent the mass of the founders. I cannot emphasize that enough. Was uh, Thomas Paine a deist according to the definition 200 years? Yeah. Okay, then he represents the founders? Absolutely not. In fact, the founders, large numbers of them, responded swiftly and with certainty when Thomas Paine came out in the open nearly 20 years after the Declaration of Independence and expressed his deistical views. In fact, John Adams said, the Christian religion is above all the religions that ever prevailed or existed in ancient or modern times. The religion of wisdom, virtue, equity, and humanity. Let the blackguard Paine say what he will. Blackguard was a term used in the 19th century to refer to an unprincipled uh, scoundrel. So there's a, a prominent founder speaking out. And look what Patrick Henry said. What is there in the wit or wisdom of the present deistical writers or professors? And yet, these have been confuted. And the fame decaying in so much that the puny efforts of pain are thrown in to prop their tottering fabric, whose foundations cannot stand the test of time. Zephaniah Swift, another prominent founder who served in the U.S. Congress in the 1790s. We cannot sufficiently reprobate the beliefs of Thomas Paine and his attack on Christianity by publishing his Age of Reason. He has the impudence and effrontery to address to the citizens of the United States of America a paltry performance which is intended to shake their faith in the religion of their fathers? No language can describe the wickedness of the man who will attempt to subvert a religion which is a source of comfort and consolation to its votaries merely for the purpose of eradicating all sentiments of religion. John Jay, first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, quintessential founder, I have long been of the opinion that the evidence of the truth of Christianity requires only to be carefully examined to produce conviction in candid minds. And I think that they who undertake that task will derive advantages. As to the age of reason, it never appeared to me to have been written from a disinterested love of truth or of mankind. In other words, John Jay was saying Thomas Paine was not writing out of an honest attempt to arrive at the truth. What about William Patterson? He said in, he was uh, one of the signers of the Constitution. Infatuated Americans, why renounce your country, your religion, and your God? Oh, shame, where is thy blush? Is this the way to continue independent and to render the 4th of July immortal in memory and song? And John Quincy Adams said, Mr. Paine has departed altogether from the principles of the revolution. A number of the founders of the uh, Declaration of Independence spoke out strongly, including John Witherspoon, Paine is ignorant of human nature as well as an enemy to the Christian faith. Charles Carroll said, Paine's work is blasphemous writings against the Christian religion. Dr. Benjamin Rush, the age of reason is absurd. Samuel Adams, when I heard you had turned your mind to a defense of infidelity, I felt myself much astonished and more grieved that you had attempted a measure so injurious to the feelings and so repugnant to the true interest of so great a part of the citizens of the United States. Well, sadly, folks, let me tell you how Thomas Paine ended his life, and there are others that spoke out against him. Do You know, he died in 1809. At the time of his death, most American newspapers simply reprinted the obituary notice that was in a public uh, newspaper called the New York Citizen. Here's what it said. He had lived long, did some good, and much harm. Do you know only six people attended his funeral? In fact, he was ostracized for his ridicule of Christianity from the nation. And after his death, his body was brought to New Rochelle, but no Christian church would receive it for burial. And so his remains were simply buried under a walnut tree on his farm. I'm telling you, Thomas Paine does not represent the founders. I wish we had time to look at uh, one other person, Ethan Allen, but our time is up. He clearly believed in the God of the Bible, although he himself expressed some deistic type views. If there were any others, there weren't very many. I'm telling you, out of hundreds, a small handful of our founders could be called deists. And then, with a modified definition from that period, they did believe in the God of the Bible. They simply challenged the supernatural origin of Christianity. But we need to understand 
they did not represent the mass of the men who founded our country. If you enjoyed America's Most Pressing Concern, you will want to read the book on which it was based, Christ and the Continental Congress, a beautiful coffee table style book that is filled with stunning pictures and powerful historical information about the founding. If you would like to have your own copies of the 15 Continental Congress proclamations, the proclamation packet is available that contains all 15 proclamations suitable for framing. You may also be interested in the prequel to America's Most Pressing Concern, The Silencing of God, available in both DVD and book formats. All of these items may be purchased at apologeticspress.org or by calling toll-free 800-234-8558.